My name is James Thompson. I'm a student of Lord Derby Academy in Highton and I am undertaking this interview for the ARC project. It is the 27th of April 2016 and I am interviewing Dr John Goldsmith. The interview is taking place at his home. Um, where are you from then? Originally. Yeah, originally. Germany. I was born in, in 1924 in a place called Düsseldorf on the Rhine. What age were you in 10? 16, on my 16th birthday. And when were you released then? In the following January. Um, what was it like inside the camp? Well, I think I ought to tell you first how I got in there, shouldn't I? Yeah, I was at school writing an English essay. I was about to take my GCSE. We used to call it the school certificate in those days. And I saw a policeman walking across the quad to the headmaster's house and I knew what he was coming for because there was another refugee boy um, who had also been taken interned on his 16th birthday. So I stopped writing and he took me home to my mother and said, pack a bag for a few days which he did, a uh, case. And then I went off in a police car to Paris and Edmonds, where there was a territorial army camp and where there were where I was put with a lot of other internees. A lot of them were students actually at Cambridge University. And we slept on on palliasses. Do you know what a palliasse is? No. It's a it's an envelope filled with straw. Yeah. It's it's all right actually, it's not bad. And then after a few days from there, we were taken by train to Liverpool and then marched to another territorial hall, which I don't think exists anymore. And we kept there for either one or two nights. And then we were taken to Highton. Now, Highton had just been built, um, but the house hadn't been occupied yet. And uh, there were quite a lot of us. And uh, the adults were put up in the houses and the youngsters, like myself, were put up in tents, army tents, in the garden of those houses. And as a matter of interest, in my house, there were three uh, Cambridge scientists who were all interned, who later became fellows of the Royal Society. It's very famous. It's a great honour, that. Great scientific, great scientific honour to be a fellow of the Royal Society. And I shared the tent with another man who was a bit older than I, who was about 20. What was it like? It was all an interesting experience. Um, but the main thing I remember is being hungry, because there wasn't enough food. And luckily I had a cousin who worked in the kitchen, and he occasionally slipped, occasionally slipped me a bit of dried bread and some cheese, which was nice, because I had a good appetite, I always have had until recently. And so, um, I don't know how long we were there, about two or three weeks, I, th I think. Um, we were put up, as I say, in this tent, and it wasn't really long enough to set up any educational facilities, but as you may know, the, the, the internees were largely Jewish, not entirely. Jewish refugees, silly really, in, uh, in turning them. Um, there was also an Italian aged about between 60 and 70 who had lived in this country for 40 years but never had never bothered to, to become naturalised. And the funny thing was he had a son serving in the British Army. And it was originally Churchill who said when asked whom, who should be interned, he said, interned a lot. And that was prompted largely by the uh, the gutter press. You know what I mean by the gutter press? No. Well, your parents, will, somebody will explain to you. Um, who said that there were a lot of, sp lot of German spies uh, roaming about in the country. Which is silly, really, because the, certainly the Jewish people were all refugees from Hitler. Uh, and um, well, you know what happened to them subsequently. And so they had no reason to spy for Germany at all. And in the First World War, a similar policy had, 
had, had applied, people perhaps shouldn't have been interned, were interned. Anyway, after a few weeks in Haydn, we were uh, put on a boat and taken to the Alamein. And there we stayed long enough for some of these Cambridge students and lecturers who had been interned to start organising, not, not exactly a school, but talks. So life wasn't boring, and at least there was enough to eat there. And then quite out of the blue, one day we were told to pack your bag, and we went on a ship to Greenwich, which is near Glasgow, and there we were transferred to a large uh, ship which had originally been um, Polish, named after one of their generals, Sobieski, and we were taken in convoy to Canada. This, this happened, I think, within about two or three months of being a term. So I can't tell you exactly how long I was in Haydn, exactly how long I was in the other men. And we went in convoy, a huge convoy. Actually, there were also German prisoners of war on the ship. They were segregated from us. Uh, and luckily, on this trip, no boats were torpedoed. And then we uh, were landed in New Brunswick, which is a Canadian province, and marched to a football stadium where we spent, I think, one night. And then we were taken by train to a newly established camp consisting of wooden huts surrounded by barbed wire, of course, quite near the, quite near the American border. And uh, Initially, the camp hadn't been finished yet, so for several hundred people, there was one water tap, and the kitchen, of course, had <laughs> kitchen, of course, had first rights. Otherwise, they couldn't have fed us. And if you wanted wanted to wash, you sort of had to get up at two o'clock in the morning. You had to queue, <laughs> but that soon that soon improved. And um, it wasn't winter yet, but um, it was summer summer at first. I think. And then when the autumn came, it got quite cold. And we were taken by trucks with a Canadian soldier to cut down trees to feed the wood stoves which were in each of the huts. And to cut a long story short, after a few months, the British government realised it really had been rather foolish to intern all these people. They sent somebody from the Home Office along to interview us individually. And I was given the choice of being released in Canada, where I didn't know anybody, or being allowed back home. And being an only child and not knowing anybody in Canada, I decided to come home, which we did again in convoy. Again, luckily, nobody was torpedoed. But you, some of you may know that a ship bound for Australia, full of German and German, German prisoners of war, and and um, the refugees was torpedoed with enormous loss of life because they, 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 were, they, were, they couldn't escape from the ship. They were behind barbed wire. The Genera, I think it was called. Anyway, now, you've asked me some questions and I'll fill in the gaps if I can. Um, how did all this make you feel? Uh, I can't really recall a moment of unhappiness. But then I've been given, I've been lucky in having this sort of personality, tends to forget the less pleasant experiences and remembers the good ones. I mean, the same about my work, you see, my subsequent work. So I, and I didn't feel too badly. I don't, can't remember feeling homesick. We, we were allowed, I think, a letter a fortnight. And all the letters were censored in case it gave information to the enemy. I don't know what enemy, but and it took a long time. But when I was in Haydn, I wrote to my mother asking her to send me some bread and margarine and cheese. And instead she sent two bars of chocolate because she didn't realise we were hungry. <laughs> so what's your most vivid memory of both camps? Not really of the camps, but 
You see, I've been in England for three years. I, I left Germany in 1933 because my stepfather was murdered by the Nazis. And I had an uncle in Amsterdam, so I went to Amsterdam. I lived in Holland for four years. Uh, and then in 1937, my mother, who was a dental surgeon, was allowed to come to England to practice, and she settled in Cambridge. So that's where I went to school. Now, what made me say this? What's my most vivid, vivid memory? Yes, the fact that after three years, I was just beginning to feel like a little English boy. And to have this shattered suddenly was quite an experience. Did you form any friendships inside the company? Um, I did. I did one with, uh, formed a friendship with a very religious man who himself had been born Jewish but had taken up the Christian faith. And uh, I had gone to a Methodist school in Cambridge, so I knew quite a lot about Christianity, of course. You know, chapel twice, chapel once a day and twice on Sundays. <laughs> Uh, but that friendship was not maintained. I, had, I maintained a friendship from school, or a lifelong one, until my friend died uh, a couple of years ago. Um, what was the hygiene like in the camp? Pretty good, because you know you, you were dealing with educated people but by and large, and uh, people who you know who were born from their families to practice good hygiene. And once we got more than one water tap, it was, it was all right. I can't remember that as an adverse feature at all. Um, no, it was good. Can you walk me through the typical day in the camp? Yes. Um, I can't recall being woken up. I think we woke naturally. And, um, and had a breakfast, which in Haydn was rather frugal, porridge and a bit of bread, bit of bread march, I suppose. Um, and the rest of the day, as far as I can recall, we were left to our own devices. Luckily, luckily uh, I wasn't in Haydn very long, because on the Isle of Man, um, there were some classes I attended, voluntarily. Um, just a funny episode from the Isle of Man. There were two um, stainless, uh, not stainless steel, um, barbed wire fences with about that much in between. And there was a soldier with a rifle walking in there, you see. We were not allowed access to newspapers or radios. This was at the time of, just after Dunkirk. And, but, but people are subject to bribery and one of the soldiers had been bribed to bring in a newspaper. And just uh, just as the soldier was about to hand it across the barbed to the chap who paid him, an officer appeared and he dropped dropped the paper and the engineer stood to the to attention and said, God save the Queen. <laughs> That's the only funny episode I can remember. But we had a lot of people in turn who later on became quite famous, such as the famous um, musical quartet. Um, I don't know, I can't, I'm getting weak on names these days as I'm getting a bit older. And there's a famous one, you almost certainly heard of it. Hans Gahl. Um, Hans Gahl? No, no. There were three, three, three continental um, soloists in the British Cellist, I think. Anyway, it, it, it's irrelevant, but you would have heard of them. And all sorts of famous people were interned. Most of them, after a while, were released. But quite a few were interned for a long time. You see, there was a system which had come in before Dunkirk of categorising internees into three groups. The A's, the B's and the C's. The A's were interned straight away as Probable, probable German spies. There were no refugees amongst those. The bees were interned uh, at the time of John Kirk, and the C's, of which my mother and I were one, um, 
were at the discretion of the local chief constable. Now the local chief constable in his wisdom thought that my mother was all right, she wasn't a danger to the state. So she was also, I think it may have been a, may have been a factor that a lot of dentists had been called up and my mother was doing a useful job of being a dentist. But uh, I was obviously, I think at the age of 16, a great danger, so I was interned. <laughs> so uh, how were illnesses and injuries treated? Oh, there was always, there was always a decent medical attention. But don't forget, by and large, we were young people and there wasn't much, there wasn't much illness about, but there was a little, in the, certainly in the Canadian camp, there was a little hospital where people, where people went. And we, we got it, we got, we were treated decently. And I can't recall any adverse treatment except in Liverpool. And that was when we were marching from Lime Street Station to the TA hall carrying, carrying our bags. And we got a lot, a lot of cat calls because the population thought we were, we were POWs. Where did you sleep in the Isle of Man camp and the Canadian camp? In the Isle of Man camp, we slept, we slept in beds. Don't forget these houses, these were houses which had been occupied, which were taken over by the government. Whereas in Heighton, they were newly built houses which had never been occupied before. Um, and in the camp, we had bunks, you know, one down, one up. So what did you do to keep occupied during the day? Good question. I wish I could remember. Um, as I say, I went to some of these lectures and things. Um, I went uh, cutting, cutting, cutting trees down for firewood. Well, that wasn't every day. And the rest of the time, I think one just socialised. I can't really recall anything else. We did, I don't think we had many duties. But of course, we had to walk to the kit, to the dining room, which was some distance away, in, in, in different sessions. And it all took down the queue a bit and so on. But I can't remember being bored. I got I read a lot of the Bible actually because I got friendly with this religious chap. But um, you know, when you when you when you're 16 or 17, you either start you either start falling for horses or for girls, and then that. <laughs> Then, then the Bible becomes less important. <laughs> so what food did you eat in the camp? Um, plain healthy is the answer to that. Nothing fancy, of course. So but there was enough. We weren't hungry in, in Canada. So... A lot, of tin, a lot of condensed milk, I seem to remember, which I quite like. <laughs> I think that's it. Is it? Oh. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Anybody else want to ask anything? I'm sorry if I'm a bit disappointing about that. Not at all. Yeah, that's all. Gold. Were you frightened? He answered that one. I'm still recording, oh, sorry. Yeah, that one as well. No, that's okay, fine. You ask any question. Even just, I think that might be to take you. Um, and sorry. You only came to school this to one. take you to police. You know, you mentioned about the category. When the police came to the... When the police came to your school to take you to No, I wasn't. No. Because the police in certainly in those days were benign force. So ask them to explain what the... But you never seen your mum then, did you? Never saw. You never seen your mum? This yes, they took me home to pack the case. And then that was in said bye to you. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. Well, they said it would be for a few that days. That well, actually, it turned out to be about nine and months. Yeah, it delayed, delayed, delayed my taking my own levels from GCSE by a year. In the meantime, my school, which had been based in Cambridge, had been evacuated to Pitlochry in Scotland. Yeah. Because the school buildings were wanted as a hospital for a war casualty. Yeah. So I then went up to Bidlockery and the school had taken over a huge hotel called the Athol Palace Hotel, very much five star. Oh. <laughs> but uh, and again that was that was fun because it was lovely country lovely countryside. And we did a lot of walking. There was a local mountain 
which I went up with a few friends and I went up somewhere it was getting very icy in ice and snow and I found I could neither get up nor get down but luckily the school scarf was rather long and my, and my friends were just above me couldn't reach me by hand but they let down the school scarf and I got up, got up that way Any more? Yeah. Yeah. Is it just when, when they're ready, go on. Um, you mentioned you were categorised. Um, could you explain what they meant? Yeah, well, I was category C, which meant that if there was uh, if there was to be interment the choice of whom to intern and whom not to intern was left to the local chief constable of the police. Whereas with A and B, A's were interned straight away and B were interned um, automatically at the time of Dunkirk. Where had other people in the Heighton internment camp come from? All over England, Londoners and all the victims. Did you have any contact with people that live near the camp in Heighton? No, no outside contacts. Luckily, I, as I mentioned, I had a cousin who worked in the kitchen, so I occasionally stripped me a bit of extra food because I was really hungry. Do you have any more memories you'd like to share? Yes. I submitted myself to a psychoanalyst in the uh, Canada, Canadian camp because I always spoke very very fast and he thought he could cure that. I leave it to you to judge whether he cured it or not. <laughs> he, he was actually um, a, a disciple of Freud. You have heard, heard of Freud? No. No? Well, you will do when you grow up. <laughs> um, he, was, he was again a refugee. He'd also been interned. And he thought he could cure my fast speech, which was fast to the point where people used to ask me what I'd said. Now, you haven't had to do that, have you? No. Good. <laughs> um, I had a few sessions with him, but I don't really think it made any difference at the time. I think, actually, I have, I do speak faster than this normally and people do have some difficulty in in um, understanding what I've said sometimes and ask me to ask me I beg your pardon or do you mind repeating that but if I'm at an occasion like this or if I'm giving a lecture as I did when I was uh, at Liverpool University um, then I can put on an act you see <laughs> You want to know what happened to me subsequently? Okay. Once we're filled fill in the hour. Um, I went back to school. I took my uh, GCSEs, O levels as we call them. I did quite well, got a few distinctions. And then I had a choice. I wanted to become a dentist like my mother. And I could either have stayed on for two years at school and taken the relevant exam, or move on to a dental school straight away and do it in one year. And as I'd lost a year, I decided to do that. So I went to the Guy's Hospital Dental School, which had been evacuated to Tunbridge Wells, and I took the so-called first, first MBDS, Bachelor of Dental Surgery exam, uh, uh, at the end of a year. But during that time, I changed my mind about doing dentistry, and I said, and I, said I wanted to do medicine. So they allowed me to do that and so I did the medical course. The first year exam was exactly identical for the BDS and the MB, Bachelor of Medicine. And then I did my, what we call the preclinical, that's before you go on the wards in Tunbridge Wells. And then I went to Guy's Hospital in London and, and um, soon the V1s and the V2s began. Do you know what they, you know what they are? No. V1s were buzz bombs. They were, sent, they, they were jet bombs. Each plane had a bomb, and when the jet 
stopped, the plane came down with a bomb and exploded. The thing about it was you could tell when that was going to happen because the noise of the jet stopped suddenly and then you had to be on your guard. V2s were much worse, they were huge bombs um, and you had no warning, couldn't tell you when to land. And so I saw quite a few casualties at Guy's. And I qualified in 1947, so I've been a doctor for almost 60 years. And um, I tried to get a job, but because I hadn't anglicised my name, I still had my original German name, and I hadn't been naturalised yet, I didn't get shortlisted for any jobs. So I thought I ought to make, ought to make a living. And at that time my naturalisation came through, you know what that is, naturalisation. <laughs> but I became a British subject. Oh. And um, so I took the opportunity of anglicising my name. It had been Hans in German my first name. Hans is short for Johann, so I made that into John, which is fair enough, isn't it? Uh, and well, I didn't want to lose the H, so I made the H into Henry, so they called me Henry John. People who don't know me call me Henry, but everybody else who knows me calls me John, which is the name I use. And it became Goldsmith instead of Goldschmidt. And then when I applied for jobs, I was shortlisted for every job I applied for, because, because I had got to good reports. And then I got a job with a very eminent neurologist at Guy's Hospital, a casualty officer. And then I moved to a small London hospital. And from there I took what's called the membership, which is membership of the Royal College of Physicians of London, which is a qualification you've got to get. Um, if you want to become a consultant physician. Guess what the pass rate was in those days? 50? 10%. So. 10%. Anyway, I got that. So, um, I told my mother it was a very difficult exam and, and she said, why didn't you take it? I said, well, what's more, it's very expensive. She said, well, you take the exam, I'll pay the, I'll pay the fees. <laughs> so I did, and I was lucky I got it. And then I did some locums, and then this time there was a compulsory call-up. So all my contemporary people who qualified with me were being called up. I wasn't called up because I wasn't, wasn't British born, but I thought I ought to go. So I volunteered for the RAF. And they wouldn't have me because, um, again, I, I wasn't British born. And I, applied, I volunteered for the RAMC, which is the Army Medical Branch. They take all the riffraff, you know, so they took me. And I asked to go to the Far East, and they sent me to the Middle East. But because I had this higher qualification, and uh, the others didn't have it, I was not supervised at all by my superiors, because they reckoned I was better qualified than they were, <laughs> even though I'd only been qualified for a year. But I immensely enjoyed my time in the Army, because I thought saw all sorts of things which you wouldn't have seen in civilian life, including a case of poliomyelitis with complete paralysis. It had to be in an iron lung. And I was hoping, having looked after this case, long before there was immunization, in other words, the, at personal risk, um, I was hoping to take this lady back to England but when she was flown back. But instead, our commanding officer, who hadn't looked after a patient for dozens of years, chose to look after her, and so I was deprived of that. I wasn't able to go back to England, mm. just, you know, for a short so. But I enjoyed my time, enjoyed my time in the RMC. And then I was sent to Northern Ireland, where, to a small hospital where the commanding officer was an alcoholic, and there were more doctors than patients, and the standards were appalling. And then they realised they shouldn't really have sent me to Northern Ireland, because being a volunteer, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't extend my period of service because it had increased from a year to 15 months during the time I was in the army. And so when they asked me, did I want to stay in, I said, certainly not. And on my way back, I had an interview in Liverpool. You know, you went from a ship from the other men to Liverpool. On my way back, I had an interview in Liverpool for a job, which I got. 
And then I very cheekily asked, could I have a fortnight's grace to think it over? Because I wanted to be nearer, nearer my home in Cambridge, because I've been away such a long time. And during that time, I got a job at a much better hospital, teaching hospital in Birmingham. So I declined the offer. And the irony is that 15 years later, I was appointed a consultant in the hospital, in which I had declined the job earlier. <laughs> there was Seton General Hospital. Do you know about it? Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore now. And then when Sefton closed, I went to the Royal. And I, my special interest was kidney disease. And I started off a treatment centre for kidney disease, which now has about 20 consultants. Uh, they do dialysis and transplantation, but that's another story. And then in my last three years, uh, I was asked, would I like to become manager of the hospital? And I said, good God, no, I want to wind down, not wind up. And I started thinking, well, it would be rather exciting doing something completely different. So my last three years, I was manager of the Royal. And then I was, then I, then you had to retire at 65 from your own job in those days. And I was asked, did I want to stay on as manager? But I said no, because what I missed was my clinical work. So I went back and did locums for another few years, Clatterbridge and elsewhere, and uh, finally retired at 70. When I didn't feel ready to retire at 65, and uh, well, I've enjoyed my retirement since. That's about that's my story. <laughs>